Today's sermon for Easter is Resurrection Joy. We're going to be focusing on joy as an anchor for the message today. Resurrection Joy, share it forever, share forever. But before we get there, uh, let's kind of pull back and consider, have you ever gone into a situation where you are inexperienced in the given format, in the given mission field, in the given sports field, whatever it is? Ever gone into a situation where you are outmanned, your team is outmanned, and you are understaffed, ill-equipped, and unnetworked, not having the right connections? And not just weak on connections, but even more deeply, vulnerable to mortal attack. And no, I'm not just talking about the Mississippi State Bulldogs. I'm talking about bigger story than that, right? Um, well, let's remember, we're going to set up to where we're going to, Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 20, with the return of the 72. But before we go there, let me remind you of our context. You can go back and listen to our sermons over the last couple months. We've moved through uh, Luke chapter 9 into Luke chapter 10. And now Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, a few weeks ago at the beginning of this month, we, we heard about this. Now, after these things... After Jesus has set his face to go to Jerusalem, after the transfiguration, after he's twice now prophesied to his disciples that he has to go and die and he's going to be handed over to be killed by the chief priests, elders, and the uh, rulers of Israel, etc., and that he will rise again on the third day, and that if they're going to go with him, they need to take up their cross and follow him. After all that, after these things, the Lord, that means Jesus, He's the Son of God. He's being identified as such. The Lord also appointed 72 others. It means 72 in addition to the apostles, in addition to the 12. These are 72 other disciples. 72 others and sent them two by two before his face to every town and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. We got a understaffed outman kind of situation here. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Go, behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. That sounds a little scary, doesn't it? Carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one. Wait a minute, we don't get to kind of Raise the skids a little bit, make social connections the way we do in the Middle East? No. Don't spend any time greeting anyone on the road. You go straight into these towns I'm sending you to. <clears throat> Nevertheless, today we're going to focus on how resurrection joy could come in that kind of context, because that does not sound good. That sounds foreboding, doesn't it? But we're called to share in that resurrection joy and to share forever. And here's why. As the Apostle Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 3, giving a doxology, really, he says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all that we can ask or imagine. Do you know that God can do immeasurably more, infinitely more, than you can even begin to think about or ask for? According to his power that is at work within us. Wait a minute. It's not just that he can do it out there. He can do it in us. His power is in us. To him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations. Throughout all generations, not just those guys back in the first century. Forever and ever. Amen. So now for our main scripture for today, Luke chapter 10, verses 17 through 20. Last week for Palm and Passion Sunday, we looked primarily at 17 and 18. Now we're going to continue reading the last two verses. The 72 return with joy. Catch that? Return with joy. Saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I have given you authority to trample serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice about this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written 
in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Resurrection joy, share forever. Bad news, though, I need to go back to some bad news. So the headline just read a couple weeks ago, we fell out of, precipitously, we fell out of the top 20. We're, we're out of the top 20. And again, I'm not talking about the Mississippi State Bulldogs here or Ole Miss Rebels or whoever else you're into. I'm talking about the United States of America. We fell like lightning. That's what Jesus is talking about, side note. If you're learning to read the scripture, come be in Sunday school or Tuesday morning with me. When Jesus says like lightning, he's not talking about visual effects, animation or something like that. He means suddenly. When Satan falls, it will be sudden like lightning. So the U.S. fell like lightning out of the top 20 happiest countries this past year. We used to be in the top five about a decade ago. Then we edged out to the top 10. Now we're not even in the top 20. Uh, you might ask, probably, who's number one? Well, Finland. Finland's a great country. Go live in Finland. People are really happy there. Um, this struck me. Israel. Even with all the turmoil, terrorism, and present war in Israel, Israel is number five among the population base who are happiest with their lives and their purpose. They, they're, they're rallied together. They've got a plan. They've got a purpose. Israel is number five among the happiest countries in the world. We're number 23, just behind United Arab Emirates. So United Arab, they've got a lot of good buildings in United Arab Emirates. You know, you could go live there. We're number 23 on the World Happiness Report this past year. It was just released earlier this month, a couple weeks ago. Now, happiness has decreased in all U.S. age groups, but most dramatically among young adults. That means adults age 18 to 30. In other words, we're talking about Gen Z. And then, of course, Alpha, Gen Alpha, is coming right up behind. Uh, American young adults rank 62nd in happiest in the world. Okay? We're behind Guatemala young adults on happiness. We're always worried about the people in Guatemala, the horrible conditions. Yeah, the idea, basically what happens is you get to a certain point where most people gauge their happiness based on their stuff and their circumstances, but suddenly you get to a pollution point or a decrepitude point where even if you have all the stuff in the world and even if you have all the digital devices and connections and so-called friends digitally in the world, you're unhappy. Because there's no real joy. Uh, in the Wall Street Journal article on this on March 19th, Claire Ansbury quoted Dr. Emiliana Simon Tomas from the University of California, Berkeley, who said, this is just a secular uh, neuroscientist analysis, uh, older adults are happier because they view life as precious and they're less, they're less self-focused and are more grateful about things. At the heart and soul of the matter though, from a faith standpoint, from a biblical standpoint, what we're dealing with is a loss of faith in a culture. A culture that loses its faith goes down really fast because the stuff, after a while, doesn't satisfy. And the purpose and the identity and the hope are gone, along with the joy. I don't believe in God, but I miss him. I don't believe in God, but I miss him. That, of course, is the famous line from really one of the signature books of the 21st century by Julian Barnes, the British intellectual and author, writes a lot of fiction, but this is from his memoir and reflection on death, nothing to be frightened of. Barnes famously said, pretty much, putting the stamp on the 21st century, in the West at least, I don't believe in God, but I miss him. Now, my concern here in what kind of used to be called the Bible Belt of the South is, is, is not so much, you know, Barnes, although I keep up with that type of thing, of course, from a, a general analysis standpoint, but 
Increasingly, what I find is the kind of average American, and definitely average American of the South, because you know, majority of Americans still say they believe in God, they just don't live like it, right? Their Sundays don't reflect it. Their Mondays don't reflect it. It's all about the weekend that has nothing to do with the Savior, right? So increasingly, the average American says, well, I do believe in God, but I miss him. Because I'd, I'd like to kind of have him in my life, but I'm just too busy with my more important gods and weekend idolatries. You know, my weekend is about all my other religions except God, so I don't have a lot of room for him, you know? Um, in, in the Bible, that's called idolatry that leads to death and hell, I can tell you that. So it's not a good move, but that is the majority standard. Charles Taylor, in his this really is the magisterial philosophical book of the early 21st century. The Canadian philosopher uh, and intellectual Charles Taylor with his book, A Secular Age. You read A Secular Age yet? You got a Sunday afternoon. It's about a thousand pages of deep, dense philosophical analysis. You may want to check into it today, uh, take a nap. Uh, anyway, Taylor in A Secular Age, it is a, a major book. I mean, it's, it's, it's monumental talks about how we live now in a flattened world with flattened people. This world, people live in all eminence, in other words, like right here, and self-absorption with no transcendence. To put it simply, it's all horizontal, no vertical in most people's lives, in, in the way they, they chart out their days. And what Taylor famously says is it's an age haunted by God. Because in, in the West, in the modern world, you know, our values, our, our, our values and virtues about people being valuable and, you know, uh, individuals mattering and that kind of thing and life, it, it all comes from a biblical mindset. But the biblical connection's been gone. It, it's lost. So we're talking about secular age, Unbelievers and, yes, a lot of so-called Christians who have a memory of God and a total need for him but are disconnected from him in the way they live. This past Tuesday had an interesting Tuesday after getting to celebrate with Veda, who is here for her first worship service also. It's awesome. Uh, after being able to celebrate Veda's birth and pray over Veda, I, head, I headed out to uh, go down to Walnut Grove Maximum Security Correctional Facility. And then after our worship with those guys in the prison, I was spending some pray and share time with one of the inmates there. He's, uh, he's serving a life sentence, actually several life sentences. He's multiple counts of armed robbery, a criminal homicide. So I'm sitting next to this guy. He's been in prison for 38 years. And I asked him, what, what does Jesus, he professes faith in Jesus. I said, so what does Jesus mean to you? How are you sharing him with others? And he said, I don't, I don't really like the guys here, and I don't like sharing. He said, I like Fox News. He said, when I get up in the morning, what I want is my coffee and Fox News. I just get back into my cell, and I want to watch Fox News. You know, they irritate me. I don't want to deal with them very much. So I started talking with him about how Jesus leads us in a different way. And he, he, this guy professes faith in Jesus. He wants to be with Jesus eternally when he gets out of, ultimately out of Walnut Grove Maximum Security Prison. Because his next stop is death, right? How about you? How do you respond to the gospel and to the joy of Jesus? Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. In other words, I got a lot of people who are kind of interested in me. I got very few people who will actually go out and evangelize for me, who will share the faith, who will be engaged in mission. So he says, therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest, to, to literally throw them out, to get them out. And then Jesus reveals himself as the Son of God here. Catch this. After saying, pray to the Lord of the harvest, he's the one who sends. Got it? Make the connection. We talked about this a few weeks ago. So he, he commands those who are willing to go into mission. And let me tell you, the ones who are willing to go into mission are actually, they have a living faith. 
They didn't just sign a card or raise their hands at a youth rally and feel good about Jesus for 10 minutes when they sang a song. I mean, they actually, these are actual believers, right? Because they're not like the guys who said, I'm busy right now, I can't go. Remember the end of Luke 9. These are the guys who are actually willing to go. In other words, they have a living faith. So he says, now look, go. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves, and don't take anything extra. I mean, this is not a propitious beginning to mission from our standpoint. And that brings us to Easter. Remember the situation? Jesus was crucified. All the leaders turned against him. Y'all remember the situation on Thursday and Friday? Um, he's dead. Everybody has bailed out on him. All his, not only apostles, but the other disciples, they've all fallen away, just like Jesus predicted. And just like he said, look, Simon, Simon, and I'm telling you, Satan's going to test all of you guys, and you're all going to fall away. It does not look good as we head into Sunday morning, the first day of the new week, does it? But you know what? What's the good news of Easter? In the worst possible situation, Easter is the ultimate revolution. It's the ultimate turnaround if you will believe it, if you will believe him. And so therefore, by definition, by its very power, Easter makes a total claim on you. If you are a mortal human being, if you are a human being that can be raised again in Christ, Easter claims you totally. You're either in with Jesus or you're not, but it's gonna claim you totally. It's not just another vacation. It's not just another extra day off from school and let's go for a trip or have some extra food. It is your vocation. So we're called in this resurrection joy to share it forever. We're going to look at responding by enjoying God, which is our main purpose. That's why we're created, to glorify and enjoy God through enjoying real faith. Rise yourself, like get up, to share his joy, his joy for his mission in his name. Jesus is excited about his mission. The question is, am I, right? <laughs> Secondly, enjoy being raised by God's grace and knowing that our names are written in heaven. And third, enjoy Jesus' resurrection joy in his ascension and Satan's fall. And we'll come back to the fourth as we close out. Now let's think about last Sunday's sermon on Palm and Passion Sunday. At the edge of eternity, love's victory. If you miss that one, you want to catch that one because that pairs with this one. It's a deep, deep combination into the heart of Jesus' ministry and mission. What's he doing? We talked about his cosmic conflict and spiritual warfare, that these things are real. And key to knowing who Jesus actually is, what he came to do, what he calls us to live out. Jesus talks in terms of Satan as having a kingdom, the kingdom of this world. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? Jesus calls Satan the ruler of this world. He's the ruler of the world you're living in right now until Christ comes again. And Paul calls Satan the God of this world. This was real for the disciples. As I mentioned, Jesus says to Simon at the Last Supper, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you, and this is plural, you all, all the apostles, all the disciples, to sift you all like wheat. And this actually happens until Christ comes again. Every believer is gonna be tested by the deceiver. It's just a reality. This is not a fringe analysis. This is actually right core center to Jesus' teaching. And Jesus says to Simon, he goes on and says, but I pray for you. Again, this is not, uh, th this is not the himos, it's, it's the su, the second person singular. But I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. You could say, but yes, pastor, but that's way back in the first century. Does that apply to us? Yes, it does. Ephesians chapter 6, 11 and 12, we're told to put on the whole armor of God so that we can take up our stand against the schemes of the devil. And the word says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's not against the Republicans and the Democrats. It's not against Vladimir Putin. Even those other cities are all important. That's not the big deal. Not against the person who was mean to you at school. I mean, none of that. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the powers, the world forces of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness 
in the heavenly places. Now, let me give you the good news of resurrection joy. You got to be anchored in this. Here's the, here's the key to the joy. Number one, the Lamb's blood saves us from sin and Satan. Number two, our Savior's spirit in us delivers us through death. He takes us through death, not around death, through death in eternal life. Three, Christ's rise means Satan's fall. And four, the ascended anointed, his love and his advocacy, keep me by name, by my own personal name. Okay, so let's look at this. Number one, the lamb's blood saves his own people from sin and also from Satan. We're not talking about just any old lamb. We're talking about the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and the lamb who is spotless. You know, at the Passover, you remember Jesus dies at Passover time, right? The lamb has to be what? Spotless. Was any human being before or after Jesus spotless? Morally? No. There's one. Jesus, right? Not Adam, not Eve, not anybody else before sin. Jesus. So he fulfills the calling of God that we might be delivered from death and sin to life. Uh, with snake antivenom, you know, it, it's a biological process where venom neutralizing antibodies are derived from a host animal, like a sheep or a horse. And it has to do with the animal being hyper immunized by one or more snake venoms. And then the process of the response producing neutralizing antibodies that can be given to others. There's one lamb who has taken the venom of the ultimate snake and risen above it. There's one. You want him and his blood for your salvation. More biblically, even than that though, is of course the standard of Torah, the law. Leviticus 17, 11, God himself says, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. For I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. In other words, in the Old Testament, the blood represents the life of the sacrificial animal. And in this case, we're talking about the blood of Jesus representing his perfect and atoning life for you. Scripture fulfilled there. So, the Lamb's blood saves his own people from sin and Satan. As Revelation 12 says, they have conquered him. In other words, Satan, by the blood of the Lamb and by the word, mission, of their testimony. For they loved not their lives, even under facing death. Secondly, our Savior's spirit in us delivers us through death in eternal life. What the Bible says is this. The same Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead fills everyone who believes in him. Are you awake and alive in the Holy Spirit? If you're not, frankly, you're going to dust in the pit of hell. I mean, that's kind of where we are, right? Are you alive in the Holy Spirit of God? In the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead through death into life eternal, you can be saved. Are you living in his spirit? Are you filled with his Holy Spirit? Are you alive in him? Third, Christ's rise means Satan's fall. We looked at this last week. Go back to last week's sermon to look at this a little bit more deeply. But remember, Luke frames it for us perfectly here at the axis point of Luke's gospel. Remember, the key verse of the whole gospel is when Jesus affirmatively sets his faith, face to go to Jerusalem into the cross, into the resurrection. Remember that? And what does it say? 951 of Luke. The days were approaching for his ascension, for him, Jesus, going up, right? In other words, to heaven. And then look at the pairing that Luke gives us in Jesus' prophetic, apocalyptic, eschatological, like bullet in 10 verse 18. I saw Satan fall from heaven. Understand? That's the dynamic we're dealing with. Fourth, the ascended anointed's love and advocacy 
keep me by name. Jesus says, rejoice that your names are written in heaven. When he's calling himself the good shepherd, Jesus says this in Luke chapter 10, the sheep hear his voice, the good shepherd's voice, and he calls his own sheep by name. Do you hear? I want to invite you to hear Jesus calling your name. He can know you personally, and your prayer life will be transformed when you hear him call your name. Now, let me step back for a moment and just say a few words about the devil or Satan. Uh, these are two terms. They're both important for the same entity. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, he's referred to as that ancient serpent called the devil and Satan. In the Greek, diabolos means slanderer. That's his ultimate place that he wants to get to, to be able to slander you and to say to God, she's not real, he's not real, he's not with you, she's not with you. But the other term comes from the Hebrew, chasatan, and in the Greek it's just kind of moved over, it's satanas, which means the adversary or the enemy. He really wants to trip you up so that he can then testify against you and bring his charges against you in the counsel of God. And you could say, why does God allow that? Hey, you need to go upstairs on that one. I can just tell you this runs all the way through the Bible, Job and through the New Testament and through Jesus' teaching until we get to Revelation as we move to the seventh trumpet, okay? Um, notice this, Revelation 12. For the accuser of our brothers, that means Christians, the accuser of our brothers, now has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. This is what Jesus is seeing. The accuser is finally going to be thrown down. And here's the good news in that. Romans 8. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all, will he not also with him graciously give us all things? In other words, if God has sent his son to save you, he will stand with you against Satan. Okay? The accusations are coming, but there's going to be no condemnation. Look at this. Who is to condemn? Well, you could say, well, Pastor Martin, you just told me. The devil's going to do it, right? Satan's going to do it. No, listen to this. Christ Jesus is the one who died. And more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God. I don't care if Satan is in the courtroom bringing ac accusations against you. The king, the anointed king, is at the right hand speaking for you. Inter intervening for you as priest and speaking for you as king, as the ultimate judge. This is what Paul's talking about in Romans 8. Who indeed is interceding for us. And then, I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers, including the ruler of the demons, right? Nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus our Lord. So... Finally, the ascended anointed's love and advocacy keep me by name. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Yes, he could be referring to the Lamb's book of life, but this is deeper here. Jesus is saying, your name is in me, and I'm in you. Don't worry about a book. Don't worry about a scroll. I know you. You're mine. And I claim you. So, how much joy does that bring? Well, if we're saved, that brings all joy, right? So we respond. And I want to invite you today then as we move ahead and as you move ahead, if you're going to be an Easter person, if you're going to be a resurrection person in Jesus Christ, to the following. First of all, enjoy real faith. Rise to share his joy from mission in his name. I got to tell you, this joy is spiritual and strong. The joy of the Lord is my strength and he's become my salvation. That's what the scripture says. And also, this is really interesting when you think about it. In the Greek, joy and grace come from the same rootage, okay? They're next door to each other. Charis, which means grace, and kara, which means joy. Well, what does that tell us? The gift brings joy, and joy brings gift giving. The gift comes in grace to bring joy and somebody who actually has joy in Jesus is going to be gracious in telling others about him and in celebrating so joy shares as David says my cup runneth over I got plenty I want to share with others right that's joy 
It's one of the great joy lines of the real Bible. I mean, my cup runneth over. So this is the answer to how to do what we're called to do, what we're created to do, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Share the gospel with others and share the gospel in worship with God. As Jesus says, whoever's not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather. In other words, if you're not engaged in evangelism and mission, you're against me. You're, you're scattering. Get in the game. Get on the team. Last Sunday, we learned the answer to the reason that many Christians are in name only, right? It's because of the disease of me and mine. Thinking far too much of me, my stuff, my, my plans, and far too little of the master and his mission. The gospel will set you free to get out of yourself and into him. Before we close, I do want to point this out to you just for Bible reading. It is so powerful. It centers around this joy and name theme. Notice this. Uh, these four verses, they, they play off of each other, the two and the two. Verse 17. The 72 return with joy. You're supposed to catch that. They call him, professing faith, Lord. They call him Lord. They profess faith. Even the demons are subject to us in your name. They understand that their power comes from him and his name. Okay? That's verse 17. I catch 18. He says prophetically, I saw Satan fall from heaven. I've unpacked that for you a little bit last week for sure. Now look at 19 and 20, which play off of 17 and 18. Jesus says, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. Who's the enemy? Satan. You see 19 pairing with 18 there in the middle, right? Okay, now let's go to the name and choice deal with 17. Okay, look on the other side of this. Verse 20. Nevertheless, rejoice. Let's get the car. It's the same term, okay? Rejoice that your names. They were rejoicing that the demons are subject in Jesus' name, but Jesus says, it's okay. I want you to focus on your names now because I'm telling you in the power of of my glory given to me by my Father, not only I inherit eternity, but you do with me. Your names. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So again, today, I want you to enjoy real faith. Rise to share his joy and his mission. Enjoy being raised by grace so that your names are written in heaven. Notice this. We rejoice not in what we do, our works, not in the power he gives us even, but Jesus says in what God gives you by grace, that he, who's writing the name? Do I write the name in heaven? He's writing the name. Jesus says, focus your whole joy and faith in my grace to you, okay? Not in what you do. Yeah, are you supposed to serve? Yeah. Will it be awesome? Yeah. But you rejoice that your name is given to you by grace. And then third, enjoy Jesus' resurrection joy in his ascension and Satan's fall. Guys here with me on Tuesday, you know we're heading this way right now on Tuesday mornings, right? The seventh trumpet. And what happens with the seventh trumpet? The day of the Lord has come and been consummated, right? And there's that chorus in heaven that says now the kingdom of this world that did belong to Satan right now the kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever our choir is going to sing that from the seventh trumpet of the book of Revelation right after the benediction be ready it is the gospel May you live it now and forever. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let's pray together. Lord, as we come before you, I know it's a festive day for all of us, and it is a gorgeous day. We give thanks for a beautiful day. But Lord, all of this and all the flowers will fade. I pray that everyone here, oh God, knows you not only knows you, but truly lives in Jesus by his blood and by the power of his spirit. I pray that anyone here who does not know for sure that he will live with you and share in your reign forever will call on your name now. 
and say, Jesus, you are raised from the dead. You are at the right hand of the Father. You're the Son of God. I'm nothing before you. But the gospel just told me that I can have a share in you and in your eternity forever. I love you, Jesus. Lord, deliver me from sin. Deliver me from myself. Let me let go of what I've been holding on to, that I can take hold of your hand of grace and know only you and serve only you and live for you in the power of your Holy Spirit. I'm yours, Jesus. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.